What is going on, Francifa? Welcome to another edition of the Bituation Room by and I. Um, my name is Francesca Fiorentini. I apologize for that. Uh, I am joined uh, right next to me by the wonderful, the uh, the co-host of the podcast, Pod Yourself a Gun, and a regular on Good Mythical Morning, Mr. Matt Lee. Hey, everyone. I'm back. I'm here. I'm on the regular show. So happy to be here. So, Thank you for having me, Francesca. You're welcome. Who's cooking dinner if we're here? I I uh, I thought this meant takeout for sure. Yeah. I thought because what you thought. Can, yeah. Well, it would be nice to have takeout. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, let us know in the comments where we should get takeout from. Just uh, you know, try to. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you where we live. Just uh, name Chinese. a genre of food. Chinese. Chinese would be good. Yeah. But anyways, I am happy to be here. Yeah, so good to have you here. Um, we have got a really good show for everybody. Um, obviously, we're continuing to talk about Afghanistan mm. and the uh, political fallout of the withdrawal from, from that country and specifically back here in the United States and how it's being received by everybody. Um, we are also going to be talking about... Uh, OnlyFans switching it up a little bit and uh, disappointing a lot of lot their of fans people. and lot their users. Of people. Uh, we're gonna not me, but you know. sure, sure, sure. Never heard of it. What? I don't know what it is. So if I checked your phone, you right shouldn't now, check my phone. But if I, if you did check my phone, you would not see an OnlyFans account. Sure. No, 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 no. I, no. I trust that. Um, also, we're gonna be talking about some COVID updates. Uh, very important uh, deaths. No, what? no, uh, VI, VID is what we call it. Oh, VIDs. VIDs. Yeah. No, but uh, no, it's obviously, it's important. We ha It's been a couple weeks since we talked about COVID and the vaccines. So we got to get into it. Mm -hmm. um, but for our conversation on Afghanistan, I've got my friend and mentor uh, and author, Max Elbaum, who has written the book Revolution in the Air. And he's been on the show multiple times and everyone should know his work and should listen to him, read his writing. He is the Nostradamus of the left. He's prophetic and he's wonderful. And I'm excited to talk to him given that um, I started my, you know, uh, anti my activism days in the anti-war movement. And Max was someone who very much politicized me and helped me think about, um, help me think about US empire and the, trying to slowly brick by brick dismantle it. And I think we are on our way this week. Just a few more bricks. We just were so close. There's like a few more left. You just got to take those bricks down and then it's done, dismantled. And then we got to find something to do with the bricks. Um, A couple of announcements though. We are going to be live in Portland on Thursday, September 2nd. Mm. That's me and Matt Lieb yes. joined by a local organizer and journalist there, uh, Max Smith, as well as a civil rights strategist who is an SPLC fellow, Eric Ward, who writes all about the rise of white nationalism in the Pacific Northwest. Generally, um, sort of the the under Trump, I think his work has been even more relevant, obviously, oh, yeah. and in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement and obviously then the Capitol riots. So get your tickets for that, y'all. Uh, right it, now. Right now. Buy your tickets. We will wait. TBR dash, or no, B, B, B I T. <laughs> dot L Y slash TBR Portland. That's bit.ly slash TBR Portland is where you can go to get your tickets. Very reasonably priced. Just do it right now. Everything's going to be COVID safe. We may be outdoors if, uh, you know, shit hits the fan. Who knows? But the point is there will be a show and it's going to be amazing and it's going to be hilarious and uh, everyone's going to be safe. It's going to be good. It's going to be a real good show. So definitely, uh, uh, if you're in the Portland area, come out. Come say hi. We're all going to hang, uh, take photos together, if and you know uh, anyone, I don't know, do whippets or whatever the fuck you, you do. If you know in anyone in the Portland area and you're like, oh, man, I can't go, but I have a friend who's like, uh, you know, super into jokes and mm -hmm. politics, mm -hmm. tell them about the show. They're super into white nationalism. In, in, like against it. Against. Super into being hating against it. Hating it. Yeah. Then that'd be good. Yeah. Which I'm a little... I'm not not concerned because right now Proud Boys are just kind of like having their run of that town. They're more proud than they've ever been of mm -hmm. being boys. Mm -hmm. They've really doubled down on the pride and the boyness. They're, yeah, they're taking out their wee wees. They're like, look, mommy. Yeah. Like, that's the whole thing. Yeah, this is a good boy wee wee. 
This is a good straight boy wee wee, white wee wee, good white wee wee, good little white wee wee. <laughs> you know, that's what they're like. I think that's what the that's that's their pretty team. much they do. That's what they on do. their flag, right? It's a little white boy. Wee wee. It's a little boy. You know, and like what well, do we we want? <laughs> Whiteness. <laughs> when do we we want it? No. Uh, <laughs> oh, um, but yeah. So get your tickets to that, and then also this podcast finally, at long last, has union made, ethically sourced, uh, artisanally created. I don't know about that. Merch. We got that merch, baby. <laughs> Bituationroom.com. Mm -hmm. Get your merch. We've got uh, the logo shirts. We've got tote bags. We also have Frantifa merch. We've yep. got stickers. They're very, very cute. Um, I have I, one on my laptop right now. Yeah, me too. Um, you can't see it because then I'd have to unplug it. It's a whole thing. You can see mine. Yeah. It's all the way over there. Okay. Oh, I got it. There, I got long arms. Check it out. Look at Woo! that. Look at that. We got that Frantifa got sticker. That Frantifa looking good. sticker right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. So get that. Uh, Bituationroom.com. And I understand that we have a problem with international shipping, but we're going to work that out. I'm going to figure it uh, out. So thank you for your patience. And also, this podcast is a Patreon. So if you are a patron, you get 20% off of all merch. So hey, that is a perk of joining also, 10 bucks gets you a shout out on this show and 20 bucks gets you access to ask me a question and AMA. I'm going to do in the next one on Thursday, August 26th. Um, but all patrons can watch that back. Uh, just our top tier get to ask me the questions. And so we entrust them with all the best questions. Um, and I thank you guys so much in advance. And the way I thank you and all of the people who support this show, whether on Patreon or whether on Venmo, TBR-Live, or Cash App, TBR-Live, is with the ceremonial fart song. Okay, okay, I think we're cooking. Thank you so much to new patrons, all the new patrons, but for the 10 buck or more shout out patrons, Roller Dragon, hell yeah, Jennifer M, Elias O, Craig, Brian M, thank you so much, Matt, please stop making that face. Oh my god. <laughs> Kyle M for the big tippers, Robert G, big tip, Mike D, big tip, and Karen K defying every Karen, making sure they are now Tina's, or Susan's, or Claire's. Um, no disrespect to all my love, lovely Tina's, Claire's, and Susan's. Uh, for the Twitch subs, Lankrishnan. And Barncat Clues, thank you so much. And also, I forgot to say a happy birthday to one of our YouTube moderators. Uh, I believe it was Chuck Diesel's birthday last week. And uh, hey, happy belated birthday, happy buddy. Happy birthday, thank you. Chuck. Thanks so much for being a mod here. Remember, if you're listening as a podcast, you're missing out. But also, I get it and I salute you. Um, and if you cannot support this podcast monetarily, I get it. Your stars are money. Go. And give this podcast five stars on iTunes. It helps people discover it. Let Leave me a note. Tell me about your favorite guests in these hundred episodes. Mm. This is the hundred and one-th episode. That's like how many Dalmatians there are mm -hmm. in that movie. Mm -hmm. I am the Cruella de Vil yeah. of the left. Just driving around looking for dogs to <laughs> kill. <laughs> a um, weird movie. Very strange movie. The reboot, very, very weird. Um, oh, all right. Yeah. Yeah. You guys, let's get into it. Everybody, put on your bitching hats. I'm sorry. Don't ever tell anyone I said that out loud. It's recorded. It's forever now. It's forever. Mm. Uh, this is What Are You Bitching About? Matt Lieb, what are you bitching about this fine Sunday? All right, I'm bitching, and this is real fast. I'm not going to take up too much time with this. Sure. But it's two things regarding mm, you get one. other leftists. Hassan Piker, all right? Okay. I'm going to talk about it right now. We're starting okay. beef. First thing about Hassan Piker I'm going to bitch about. Number one, leave him alone. It doesn't matter that he bought a, a an expensive house. Every house in Los Angeles is expensive. Yep. And every time a leftist earns any money at all, everyone who's basically a right winger goes, oh, well, looks like you're doing capitalism. And it's like, it's the system that we're in currently. There's yeah. like the idea that we would expect uh, only true leftists to like completely live in poverty is number number one. It's antithetical to uh, you know the actual ideas. Like it doesn't really um, like it doesn't track 
ideologically. That's you I know. I don't know. This, you lost me at antithetical. Well, it just became a very nerdy. It's antithetical. It's antithetical to <laughs> no. It's just like uh, what I'm saying is that uh, the this is like a, a right wing framing of leftists. Of is course. that like if, if you're a true leftist and you believe in socialism, you should be poor. And it's like that doesn't even that doesn't make sense. You should never own a home. Right. I mean, and that's the thing. Like you know back. We've talked about the the frame, the wording sellout and how like in the 90s, it was like, that was such a cool, like, oh yeah, you're a sellout. You're, a sellout. you're, you're not sell real Now like we're me. like, oh my God, bless you. You can afford a home. Yeah. Good for you. Go. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Like, right. Save yourself. Yeah. Now, we'll all die here. Now, like <laughs> now, whenever I hear a band that I like have a song in a car commercial, I'm like, thank God, dude, they're making some money. Yeah, like right. I'm happy for them. Totally. And totally. I'm happy for Hassan Piker for, you know, being able to, it's, it's, not, he's not going to live alone in the home. It's for a family. It's here. for him. Like the idea. Yeah, do you that, have a second point? Oh yeah. Second point about Hassan. Like, a year, maybe 18 months ago, he said, I will be on Pod Yourself a Gun, the world's only Sopranos podcast. And you know what? Ever since he got big, he stopped returning my DMs. What happened, Hassan? You're afraid to talk about Tony Soprano? Don't use my podcast <laughs> to try and like catfish Hassan to do your podcast. Trying to dude. book Hassan via you right now. Hey, if you're a real true socialist, <laughs> you'll hey, go on. What up, Twitch? Is he streaming right now? Yeah, if he's streaming right now, here. get that. This is a, this is a challenge. We're a challenging Hassan Piker <laughs> to go on my podcast and talk about the Sopranos. No, no, no. But first, he's got to go on my podcast. Oh, come on. Then, you sure, know. okay. First, he'll go on the situation. But then, after you're done, immediately after, you're gonna go and talk about the Sopranos. We're about okay. to hit season six. It's a great season. So, Hassan. I, I challenge thee. I don't know how online Yeah, that's works. what it is. That's I challenge thee. Yeah, and then you break your camera. That's yeah, yeah. how it works. Right. Uh, no, it's funny because I do feel like, you know, when, you know, another unmentionable, the unmentionable, um, terrible leftist bought a house mm -hmm. in the Valley, I, for, for like five million or something, I was like, like, fuck him. You know yeah. what I mean? Fuck him. He has all the money in the world and he's made it through grifting. And the difference between that person yeah. and Hassan Piker is that I like his Hassan's politics. Yeah, Hassan's politics are good. Like, I think good. Hassan's politics are good and I think he's smart. And so it's just like, oh, dude, I guess, is that because, am I a hypocrite? No, I just support people whose politics I think are pretty good. No, if you make your- <laughs> But if your if, politics are shit, I'm like, yeah, yeah you're shit. You're like, den you're denying Syrian war crimes. Right, and like, right. Then you make another 100,000 on YouTube. I'm like, ah, yeah. I'm not with that. Yeah. So, you know, hey. There's, there's levels to it. I mean, obviously there's levels to it, but here's the thing. If your politics are good and I like your content, I'm going to be happy for the fact that you have a house. That's true. That's it. And also it's just a rehash of the Bernie thing. When it was like, oh, Bernie has three houses. You know, he should be poor. And I'm just like, oh, it's such a tired argument. Anyway, if you're just, if you have no idea what we're talking about, a Twitch, uh, a Twitch streamer, streamer mm -hmm. bought a socialist Twitch streamer, bought a almost $3 million home in Los Angeles. That's what happened. I'd be and very surprised if anyone didn't know who Hassan Piker was. Okay, that's fine. Especially not who listens to this podcast. Um, All, all right. right. You done? I'm done. You done? You going to plug your podcast again? Okay, Pod you're done. Again. You're done. Um, I'm complaining about something very simple. Um, my body is giving out on me. Mm. I have repetitive strain injury, tennis elbow, RSI, uh, that's RSI is repetitive strain injury, uh, carpal tunnel. I got pains in my arms and lately my body's just like, no, you're doing too much. You need to not be a streamer as a job. You need to lie down and have babies. This is the time. <laughs> What? Is that Matt's eyes got real wide. No, but it no, but it doesn't feel uh, like that. But it's also and or you need to marry rich, you know. Well, you don't. That's that's kind of ridiculous. I mean, I feel like I mean, what's rich? You know what I mean? <laughs> you like, know, like I, someone with like you know a two point seven million dollar home. All right. Well, you know, the, 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 my my Patreon's Hassan, pretty good. You're going on Matt's show, and then we're getting married. <laughs> no. that's what's gonna happen. Um, no, but honestly, no, my body... I'd be I'd be honored to be cucked by you. <laughs> <laughs> no, my body is, uh, it's hurting. And I, I've done a whole episode about like all the alternative medicine crap, which actually really does work. Osteopathy, yoga, you know, not drinking so much alcohol, drinking water, but it's just my, my body's in pain. People are like, are you going to do a solo stream? Are you going to do this? You're going to do that. And I would really like to, but I just can't type that much. And I can't click. I can't be constantly on the computer. My, my whole fucking shit is just like 
raging and uh it's our it's like arthritis it's tendonitis it's all the things you guys make sure you're taking care of yourselves you get off the computer uh, yeah. you're stretching and and you're eating right etc yeah. um all right with that let's get into this we got to go real quick okay uh a lot of things happened this week. R&B singer R. Kelly's criminal trial is underway. And can someone please keep him from preying on the girls outside the courthouse? Oh, uh, no. All right? That's what he does. I just didn't... do that. Stop him from talking to the quote-unquote fans. Um, Haiti's death toll is rising, of course, after a 7.2 magnitude, magnitude earthquake. Magnitude. Magnitude. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, take that. You fucking earthquake. <laughs> yeah, I would call you a magnitude. You're, ma oh, you're magnitudes. <laughs> Eat it, <laughs> earthquake. Um, most private insurance companies are now starting to bill people for out of pocket costs uh, for COVID related treatment uh, because, of course, they of can. Course, of course. And they're going to. Because this is where it was going. Uh, Mike Richards steps down as the new host of Jeopardy so soon amid reports of derogatory comments that he made and workplace discrimination, but he keeps exec is his executive producer job because uh, what is failing up? Uh, and Representative Matt Gates eloped with a 26-year-old woman and then posted a photo of her while she was sleeping on the plane. Cool. Which, let's be honest, won't be the worst non-consensual thing he'll do on his honeymoon. Okay. Wow. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. For everything else, this Ooh. is the week where. All right, a little bit of a COVID update. It's important to check in. Um, this was the week where, once again, COVID is proselytizing the vaccine by killing more and more Americans uh, and proving that the vaccine does work. Um, deaths have gone up in the last 14 days by 99%. Shit. We're about to hit 630,000 Americans who've died, uh, now mostly in areas with large unvac uh, unvaccinated populations. Remember, only 51% of this country is fully vaccinated. And while that sounds grim, um, there's a silver lining, which is that this week, the virus has been taken out some VIDs, some very important death uh, people, whatever, you get it. <laughs> I tried. Um, so people who were actively spreading falsehoods about COVID and the vaccine. Um, and look, I'm not going to celebrate this person's death. No, no. But I'm going to really not like me trying to shed a tear is just like, yeah, I, eyes are dry. <laughs> yeah. Just really um, squeeze it out of there. One was a Republican Tea Party leader, I believe, in uh, North, North, South Carolina. GOP leader who opposed the COVID vaccine dies after battling the virus for several weeks. Um, South Carolina. His name is Presley Stutz. And he spread conspiracy theories online about the thing that probably killed him. So this was his Facebook post only a few weeks ago. It is a meme that says Delta variant is just code for too many of y'all aren't scared anymore. <laughs> and he tweeted this with a comment that said, yepper. <laughs> yepper. Oh, it's like it is tragic, but also don't write something so silly before you die. <laughs> this is this is like how I know you're gonna die mm -hmm. while tweeting and driving. Yep. And it is and it'll be like lam lam da bam bam, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like in the middle of the lam, and I'll be like, oh yeah. god. Yeah, yeah. I'll be at your funeral yeah, yeah. and I have Tony to Soprano wouldn't have been a Q guy. He definitely would have been like a left wing <laughs> such <laughs> and that yeah. That's how I'll go out. That's how it'll go out. Okay, so there was someone else, obviously. Um, a uh, another casualty of the idi idiocy was syndicated conservative radio talk show host. So again, very, very, very listened to uh, far and wide. Um, Phil Valentine mm. died also of COVID. He was only 61 years old. He expressed lots of skepticism of masks and the, the vaccine. And he even recorded a parody song entitled Vax Man, which mocked the vaccine. And again, Matt, I'm thinking of you because like you record a lot of parody songs. I do songs. a lot of parody songs for the Sopranos podcast. And yeah. what if you were just like killed by the mob <laughs> or by Stephen Jenkins? Like that'd be <laughs> really funny. <laughs> I just get whacked by Stephen Jenkins for doing too many Third Eye Blind slash Sopranos mashups. He's just like, I'm fucking done with this. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Steven, if you're watching it, I love you, buddy. You're good. You're, you're, you're a good you're sport. Too. Don't kill me. Don't Dave. kill me. Too ironic. You know. But yeah. So like the cavalierness, which with some of, with which some of these people talked about COVID, spread lies to their followers. You know, obviously, again, not celebrating the death, but man, I think it's better that they're well, not spreading quiet. misinformation. I mean, there is it, it's. <laughs> Quiet. Just be quiet. I don't wish death upon anyone, but people who are actively going out there and trying to like strengthen the uh, this ideology of, um, you know, rugged individualism to the point of not giving a shit whether or not you die yep. uh, and spread a disease to other people and watch them die. Like silencing that voice is sad, obviously, but also uh kind of hard to cry about it you know what i mean Absolutely. so it's a little bit hard and <laughs> uh, nothing's coming nothing's Nothing, coming no out. teardrop yeah. um, also it's just embarrassing i mean really though people are when they're writing the post they have to think like do the calculus like is it worth it for me to write this anti-vax anti-mask post if i die of this virus and they have to go like fuck it dude yolo and then press post yeah meanwhile many people's family members are like in you know issuing statements saying please get vaccinated yeah that was the case uh i believe with uh stutz's family yeah the the, the tea party leader from south carolina's family was like please be vaccinated yeah so yeah it's you think your parents posts are embarrassing yeah um obviously there are breakthrough cases one of the big breakthrough cases is um hitting the reverend and civil rights leader Jesse Jackson and his wife have been hospitalized with COVID. So please keep them in your thoughts and prayers if you deal with that kind of stuff. But, you know, I can't help but think that they've done their job. You know, they did what they needed to do to keep themselves safe and they mm -hmm. still got COVID. And I know that there are those other hospital beds and attention for people who did not do what they had to do to keep safe. Yeah. And they're being attended to equally. N now I've heard of a doctor who refuses to attend patients who were not vaccinated. Look, honestly, if I were a stressed out doctor in an ICU, I might say the same thing. I mean, it'd be hard to uh, like, I, I can't really put that doctor down because of the fact that I can't put myself in his position of being inundated with people who are, you know, unvaccinated and who got the virus uh, at this point. And then just being like, you know, get being mad about it. I, I get I get being mad I'm about so it, mad. but it is a failure more so of the healthcare system and of the VAX rollout process that well, there are tons of people in this country who have not been able to get a vaccine because of the fact that it's actually not as easy as, you know, it should be. Uh, so I, I think that's. Yeah. No, no, I think but so. that is not necessarily where uh, that's the, not the, where the blame primarily lies. It lies in the leaders and our leaders. Oh, like, for Trump. sure. For sure. It lies in in our leadership one way or another, whether it's, you know, Trump going out there telling people not to believe it. And then all of the GOP doing the same thing. He or, did have a rally recently where he's like, get it. I mean, I got it. But, you know, freedom. Yeah, right. I mean, because very, these, very iffy. Uh, yeah, these guys are 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 just, uh, you know, they're they're selling you on this bullshit while at the same time protecting themselves. And uh, you'd figure that would be a sign for people to be like, oh, I think I'm being played. But uh, no, people still some people enjoy the game. Yeah. Um, so back in New York, uh, Mayor Bill de Blasio is rolling out vaccine passports um, and passport checks for New Yorkers, fines if people do not comply, um, if they want to go into a bar, a restaurant, a movie theater, a club, uh, a, a gym. And uh, here is Fox and Friends big mad about this and also big confused. First, we hear from Bill de Blasio about why he is instituting a vaccine passport. This is a way of protecting people. But for the many, many establishments, they still have a huge number of people they can serve right now who are vaccinated. And we know a lot of people are now gonna be encouraged to get vaccinated because of these mandates. It's just the truth. It's gonna be the decisive factor for a lot of people. So this is, this is about moving us out of a global crisis. That's what's motivating us. 
What if you have the antibodies, and what if you can't get the vaccination? You have to shelter in place now, like an like American in Afghanistan? And if you don't, these people are the worst, these inspectors. They're going to come blitzing in there, these health inspectors. They're going to find you $1,000 for your first offense. Think about what everybody's been forced to do in the hospitality industry. $1,000 for your first offense, and it's going to go up to 2500 after that. Well, he could be right. It could actually force people or convince people to go ahead and, and get the vaccine so that they so can go into these places. People making well, their own decisions. You shouldn't get the mayor making your medical decisions. Well, I, you know, if you had talked to him, he'd say, he would say it's a public health crisis. Who wants to and, talk to him? Well, he's the mayor, you said. <laughs> Who wants to talk to him? He's just some guy. He's fucking king of New York. I love <laughs> Steve Ducey just being the voice of reason is just like, do you realize how dumb Steve Ducey is? He's oh, a one, very stupid One of the man, dumbest men but who've ever walked the earth. Even for him to be like, he just has kind of like this, like, I'm a stupid dad. And yeah, be, yeah. I'd rather people not die. But anyway, are yeah. we going to keep talking about this? Okay, I'll, I'll keep collecting my check. Anyway, uh, but he is the mayor. Like, yeah. just trying to talk Brian Kilmeade off this ledge. Meanwhile, Brian Kilmeade is just like, he's just piecing together um, different talking point memos that he has in his head that he knows points he's supposed to hit. He used the word blitz. He talked about Americans stuck in Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, hit he Afghanistan. Just, yeah, he's just like hitting all the points. He was like, freedom, uh, Afghanistan, uh, 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 freedom fries. Like this dude is just totally scrambled in his brain trying to justify why he should hate something that uh, should be required. Sorry. Uh, yeah. vaccines, uh, passports should be a requirement. It should be a thing. We should all be able to have our fucking vaccine card checked, uh, because this is a very deadly disease. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I will. I mean, I'm curious to hear from New Yorkers how it's going. So please let me know. Oh yeah. Um, because I know that there's multiple ways of like checking, like there, you know, there are many, many people rolling out fake vaccine cards, which like somehow i thought that wouldn't have been a thing because i was like why would that so much effort like oh, of course it's a thing oh yeah there's digitized cards but there's like three different vendor not vendors but three different applications you can use and you're like why not just pick one yeah just use a new york city a new york city like app just create a new thing you know it's like no no, no. there's like three different vying apps for uh -huh. it uh totally ridiculous um but yeah, I, I like also how Ainsley Earhart, who's the woman on Fox and Friends, main 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 host during the week, she's just in the middle there, probably like thinking about how later she has to go sleep in the same bed as Sean Hannity. Oh no, are they? They're yeah, because they're like a thing. Oh, imagine God. like after every night of like Sean Hannity, just like the next stage, like. <laughs> Oh God! <laughs> oh, what a nightmare! And a flash, Ugh. flash of his little hairy nipples, you know. Flash. Oh God! You know. Huh? Okay. Um, by the way, Fox News itself in its own building is requiring its it is, uh, employees to disclose their vaccination status Damn. so they know whether they keep you in little bubby bubs or whether they wear masks around you or not. Um, look, this is one step so closer to socialism. And uh, yeah, there you have it. Fox News. Look at that. Fascist, socialist, whatever's. Um, all right. Let's move on to our next story. Uh, this was the week where the subscription-based, largely pornographic site OnlyFans let its users know that they want everyone to start using their imaginations <laughs> as they will no longer be allowing some of the most explicit content that of course, has outraged many users of the platform and sex workers explicitly uh, who say that it is the safest way for them to earn a living. Here is one uh, once a uh, someone who uses the platform for that, she says, it's really just like sex workers are asked to run from one platform to another, uh, pointing out how Tumblr's valuation dropped from a billion to three million after it wiped explicit porn from the site. We never just have a safe place to do our jobs. It's obvious that this is bad for business. You'd think so. But, uh, you know, it just, it shows that, uh, you know, VCs uh, in Silicon Valley um, will literally find any reason to fuck up a good thing. <laughs> Uh, especially when it comes to like uh, explicit content like porn, yeah, you know, because they they really it's an it's the most boneheaded move. I thought it was fake really? when I first saw that there was like a, OnlyFans may consider dropping porn pornography, and I was just like, oh, this is what is this like? 
the onion or some shit. Like this has to be a joke. Yeah. That is their bread and butter. Yeah. You know, that's it's but it, it's real. And I was like, this is exactly like Tumblr. I remember when Tumblr did that. And I was just like, yeah. you do know who uses Tumblr, right? It's like but, I thought it was just like cat memes and knitting, but I didn't know. I yeah, don't but use Tumblr. For the that. cat memes and the knitting uh, and the knitting turned into like uh you know furries knitting cat suits. Okay. And then it just got more and more explicit as it went along, and then it just became like kind of a porn place and a place also for like sex workers, you know, to like sell to you know sell pictures and videos and whatnot. And it was like a lucrative thing for mm -hmm. for a lot of sex workers and like all these online sex workers want to do is just be able to, you know, do their business. And there is, you know, only fans proves that there was a high demand for this. And it's also the safest. It's yeah. the safest shit they can do. It's like the Patreon of porn. Like basically people, it's like getting people outside of the really like- Only uh, friends is my Patreon. Well, it is an only friends. Only friends. But no nakeds. No nakeds. But I no, mean, it's just, a, it's, a, it's a safer place. It's uh, people can get out of the kind of like mainstream porn business, which is, a, you know, pretty exploitative and, and this uh, happened can with be gross. So it's, you know, why would they do this? This happened with back pages, right? Oh, well, back pages had like a, you know, the, the whole bill that was passed against um, right. basically FOSTA SESTA. FOSTA SESTA, exactly. And, uh, you know, it's just like, there's just a lot of uh, anti sex worker bills. And then there's also a lot of just anti sex worker sentiment uh, in places where you, it feels like the OnlyFans should have accepted right. its role as like, this is a place for porn people to do porn stuff. Let me let me introduce a few more uh, tidbits about this story and see if it changes things at all. So the reason that it seems that uh, OnlyFans went this way is because uh, after this Axios, as this Axios report said, um, OnlyFans couldn't secure outside investors who were reportedly hesitant to get into business with the company due to the explicit content hosted on its platform. Um, in order to ensure long-term sustainability of the platform and continue to host an inclusive community of creators and fans, we must evolve our content guidelines, the company said in a statement. Creators will continue to be allowed to post content containing nudity as long as it is consistent with our acceptable use policy. Uh, these changes are to comply with requests of our banking partners and payout providers. So, yeah, once again, if everything were just Bitcoin, this wouldn't be a problem. <laughs> um... So that that's why now the most interesting thing to me, mm -hmm. other than you're right, that like Silicon Valley trying to just ruin every platform that is more and you can apply it to porn, but you can also apply it to like, you know, pretty much anything like the dem democratization of the web of the web, you know, and mm. not having everything sort of slowly look the exact same right. feels like this is just more of a, like a nude Instagram is what this is going to be, which I would argue is mostly Instagram. Um, Almost. but there's someone invested that maybe they wanted to rid themselves of. So, um, there was, the firm reportedly wants to be taken more seriously. And with the help of clean cut investors with deep pockets, it could partially buy out porn baron Leo Leonid Leo Radvinsky, who holds a majority stake in the company. And I was like, who is this guy? Well, Radvinsky is uh, not a great guy. So mm. 20 years ago, before the internet pornography was widely available for free, he ran an empire of websites that advertised access to illegal and hacked passwords to porn sites, i.e. not giving porn stars and porn websites their money having workarounds uh including ones that were advertised as featuring uh underage performers in the late 1990s such link sites were common and were used to market not just pornography but online gambling and other gray market activities which mm -hmm. i didn't know what gray market was i'm not so sure either. apparently maybe they're trying to get rid of this douchebag yeah who doesn't sound like a good person yeah, but it also sounds like um, I mean I don't I don't know the story around them trying to I mean if they're trying to say well the reason that we need investors is so that we can get rid of this guy it just that doesn't uh, I, I would have to hear more about that because that sounds like uh, can't you just buy out investors you're yeah. saying you you can't just buy them out I mean it, it just it, that sounds kind of like bullshit to it me. sounds like bullshit that they couldn't find the money that they're not making money they take 20 percent of right. users uh income and not it's only that but to me the idea that they're like well we couldn't sell you know uh we wanted more investors for more funding and it's just like 
what is you don't need infinite growth in OnlyFans. I'm sorry. What mm. what else? What are you gonna do? Buy an uh, OnlyFans stadium? Like, what are you trying to do here? The, the idea that there's not feel like there's, there's not enough money is crazy to me. Yeah, that is crazy. Yeah. It does feel like they're just like if Facebook were to buy them, they'd be like, thank God. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, which would be hell. I think that nobody wants to see Zuckerberg naked. But that well, not I mean, even his wife. No. I mean, first um, of all, smooth like a Ken doll. I think we all know that. <laughs> like there's no way that Nothing. Th if there's if there's some person we saw out him there, on that hoverboard. He does not have genitalia. I'm no, saying this an right alien. now. And he's I know planted. I know we're on Facebook right now. Mark. If you're listening, we're not on Facebook. You do not have genitalia. We're not on Facebook. No. Oh, you should get on that. It's a very good website. <laughs> <laughs> I do think there's a correlation between me not responding to a recruitment email from OnlyFans. I know. And them needing money. <laughs> the best thing I saw. They, they really scraped the barrel. They were like, please. The best thing I saw, it was like, this news came out two days after Rachel Dolezal started an <laughs> <Yes>. OnlyFans. <laughs> <laughs> and, be, and they were like, no, 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 no naked pictures anymore. <laughs> People were like, no, no, nothing no. explicit. Oh man, yeah, no one, uh, no one want to see that. Told us all. I've got like really fucked yeah. up thoughts about what that would be. Ah, uh, well, you know, uh, he, she definitely would try to put it in the ebony section of the porn She'd site. She'd be like, you can touch my hair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Pay me $50. Oh, Jesus. She's just like, it's me, ebony queen, Rachel Dolezal. <laughs> no. No. That is really, really funny. All right. Finally, Finally, this was the week where, um, in the sort of the biggest news of the week, at Martha's Vineyard, um, Martha's Vineyard just turned into a site of old wealthy Jew on old wealthy Jew violence. Yeah. Uh, as Larry David and Alan, I have a perfect sex life, Dershowitz, mm -hmm. clashed in a bougie general store and according <laughs> to page six, had this argument over Dersh's support of Trumpers. So Dershowitz says, uh, Let's do, I'll do, uh, I'll do, do little... Dersh, you do David. Okay. Okay. All right. We can still talk, Larry. No. No, we really can't. I saw you. I saw you with your arm around Pompeo. It's disgusting. He's my former student at Harvard Law. I greet all of my former students this way. I can't greet my former students. It's disgusting. Your whole enclave is disgusting. You're disgusting. Well, f is there more? No, that was it. <laughs> yeah. That was good. That's disgusting. Yeah. You're disgusting. I, I would love if they just both looked at each other and dun, 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 dun. Yeah. Um, apparently, according to Dershowitz, because we don't have David's side of this. Yeah. Um, apparently it wasn't funny. Everyone's like, oh, it's a curb, but apparently it was really serious. So Dershowitz says um that they that he and David had been friends for many years until the lawyer began working with the Trump camp. Uh, yeah. Uh, he even claimed that he helped get one of David's daughters into college and had once represented him pro bono in a legal dispute he had on the Massachusetts island where they both spend their summers. That's in Martha's <laughs> Vineyard. Um, where we, sum we, su we summer we in Martha's summer Vineyard. We summer together. Ooh. <laughs> While he was writing bad jokes, I was helping bring about peace in the Middle East. What? I'm sure it's told us. <laughs> what has he done? Larry oh. is a knee-jerk radical, Dershowitz told Page Six. He takes his politics from Hollywood. He doesn't read a lot. He doesn't think a lot. Oh, my God. I First of all, I love that uh, Alan Dershowitz is, thinks that he made peace in the Middle East. <laughs> I, like I, what? What? What is he talking about specifically? Where? Where's the piece that he brought about? Yeah, there was. There's a new Trump settlement. There's an illegal <laughs> Trump settlement. Yeah. That's uh, the the capital was moved to Jerusalem. Oh, like the the fact that he thinks it's been pretty. It's pretty pretty quiet there actually lately. Have you noticed? Oh yeah, nothing. Nothing happening. at all has been happening. Yeah, no bombs, no, no rockets, no, no displacement. Real quiet. Yeah, being real sarcastic. For those of you out there who can't read sarcasm, a lot of shit's happening. It's not being covered right now. And yeah. it's very fucking annoying. Um, Dershey, Dershey also, I said perfect sex life. You know, he said that yeah. when he was interviewed about his relationship with Jeffrey Epstein. He was like, I have a perfect sex life. I've never done anything wrong. As you can tell, I fuck normal. <laughs> what if Dershowitz was the only creepy old dude who went to the Epstein Island and nothing sexual happened? 
honestly, uh, there's like part of there's me. There's no chance that that's re- that that happened. Well, yeah, there's definitely no chance that that's actually what happened. Yeah. But there is also there's a small part of me that goes like he is just revolting enough. Yeah. That there, I'm sure people were like, Jeffrey, no, <laughs> no, seriously, fuck you. And, <laughs> and and Epstein was like, all right, all right. All right. <laughs> you know, like because he's God. He's so, and I mean, Dershowitz is so proud of his. He, he's so proud of his relationship with Epstein. He's like in the Epstein doc talking about it. Yeah, I, I love. Know he's proud about it, but he's not ashamed. No, and he no, should no. be. Uh, and he and, did work with the Trump administration. Yeah. He was backing them up all the time, and the right would herald him and have him on Fox News constantly mm-hmm. to say, "Look, this is was a Hillary Clinton supporter, a Clinton man," mm-hmm. and and here he is. Uh, saying that there is no case for impeachment against the president both times. Mm-hmm. Um, Dershowitz is the worst. I'm so glad Larry just Larry David just my, yelled my, at him. My favorite part about the article was the fact that uh, at one point uh, Alan Dershowitz took off his shirt to reveal another shirt <laughs> that said, "Wait, here this is." <laughs> yeah. Uh, he Larry walks away. Alan takes off his t-shirt to reveal another t-shirt underneath that says, "It's the Constitution, stupid." I. I- <laughs> And then we're told Durs drove off in a dirty, dirty Volvo. <laughs> uh, I just, I really. Is that re- I can't even believe. I don't even know if that's real. I believe it. 100%. I believe that he got so worked up. He's like, I'm schwitzing in here. And he took off one of his t-shirts. And then he he had his his undershirt. All of Dersh's undershirts are parody shirts that say it's the Constitution stupid. <laughs> it's like, it's either that or an I'm with stupid like wife beater. That's what he wears consistently. Because underneath it all, he's a clown. He is indeed. All right. We got to move on to yeah. our main sitch. But first, some comments from the good people in the comments section. Uh, thank you so much for being here. By the way, I hope you've hit like on the stream and subscribe to this channel uh, if you are watching on YouTube and that you're following on Twitch. Uh, as always, um, the wonderful Todd Roy. It's Todd Roy's birthday today. Hey. Happy birthday, Todd. You're a Virgo, a Leo, a, on the cusp. I love it. Um, thanks for being here. And Todd writes, the Proud Boys being allowed to continue vandalizing and doing what they do. That is what I'm bitching about. Same. Uh, always. Marty Hunt on YouTube. Greg Abbott and his school not enforcing the mask mandate. And my granddaughter's school that has been in session for two weeks. And they have already had 18 cases diagnosed. Ugh. That is a good reason to be angry. Yep. On COVID, Darren uh, S. on YouTube. Is he dead? Yupper. <laughs> wow. Oh, <God. laughs> it's very funny. Um, on Twitch, Dobbs Merck, I work door security in Brooklyn. It's made my job a ton easier. The Venn diagram of people who don't want to get vaccinated and the people who cause trouble in bars is just a circle. Mm. Nice. That is so, so true, right? Like, Mm -hmm. yeah, you could smell them for a mile away. Just stay at home, have a party in your house with other unvaccinated people. Yeah. Um, and thank you for your service bouncing at the door. Uh, I'm sorry. I tried to get in with a fake ID all those years ago. Uh, on OnlyFans, Dave K, thank you so much for the super chat. There was a report that OnlyFans effed up controlling underage content, so now they're punishing adult sex workers for their mess. That's mm. I've also read that for yeah. sure. And YTP renewed. I'm tired of these sites trying to throw porn under the bus when they are the reason they made it big in the first place. God damn right. Remember where you came from, most <laughs> websites. <laughs> Honestly. And then, on Larry David Stone Cold Coder says, friend is a good Larry David. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Right? Solid B plus. Um, and then I didn't thank all the super chats from last week, but um, Byron Popwell, Farrell Jane, and Matt Gates on White Four Bronco and Robert, thanks so much for those super chats. Really appreciate it. Once again, patreon.com slash bituation room to become a patron. Get that 20 bucks off of your merch. And before we um before he loses his mind, because this man, this man is a very temperamental guest. Um <laughs> We're talking about Afghanistan. Uh, I'm excited to dig into what has been going on in the last week now that the U.S. has left and the Taliban has uh, taken over once again. Oh, my God. See how quickly that happened. Um, uh, This is The Sitch. And joining us for The Sitch, 
He has been active in the anti-war, anti-racism, radical movement since joining Students for a Democratic Society in Wisconsin in the 1960s. He was a founder of the of War Times, uh, Tiempos de Guerra, a bilingual tabloid project in the months after 9-11 and is currently an editor of Organizing Upgrade, which you should all check out. He's also the author of Revolution in the Air, 60s Radicals Turned to Lenin, Mao and Che. Uh, re-released by Verso Books in 2018 with a new forward by Black Lives Matter co-founder Alicia Garza. Yeah. Please welcome Max Elbaum. Woo! Hey! Hi! What's going on, Max? Uh, well, there's a lot going on. I guess that's what uh, we're <laughs> here to talk about, one small part of what's going on. So, Oh, yeah. Too much going on. We are. To process. And I've you know, always as, as someone who came up in the, you know, uh, anti-Vietnam War era and uh, did see the evacuation uh, from Saigon, maybe not in first person, but uh, on television. Um, and now we have another, um, the longest war in American history next to Vietnam and a Saigon-like situation that, you know, many people say was avoidable. I personally very much disagree with whether it was avoidable or not. Mm -hmm. But what has been just, I know this is a really broad question, but like what's been going through your mind and how did you first react, you know, last week when we found out that, you know, the Taliban had indeed taken back control um, of that country? Well, you know, it's not a good moment for anybody. Uh, but it, this country, and especially the political class and the chattering class, the media class, the mainstream media class, mm -hmm. I mean, the lack of uh, the short attention span, the lack of self-reflection. I mean, here, everyone's writing about the spectacle of the last few days. Mm -hmm. This country has, Afghanistan has been at war for 40 years. This country has been uh, decimated. The numbers of people killed, maimed, wounded, and there's no reflection or little reflection about the role that the United States played in that well before the United States invaded after 2001. Oh, Going yeah. back to its support for the Mujahideen, for the, those forces during the period of the Soviet intervention. Right. And it it is really, in that way, it's very similar to what I felt on April 30th, 1975, when I was in front of the South Vietnamese embassy, which was then being closed in San Francisco, where everyone was talking about the scene in Saigon, mm -hmm. uh, when the last Vietnam had been in war, for 50 years, before, for 40 years before that, mm -hmm. since, since the uh, World War II, for, you know, the independent struggle before then. Mm -hmm. And again, the country had been ruined, Agent Orange, the numbers of Vietnamese killed, the numbers of Americans killed much higher in Vietnam than in Afghanistan, but still uh, high in Afghanistan. Yes. And little reflection about what lessons you could learn from that and what the what uh, the US power had done and just an amazing degree of self-centeredness yeah. in, in this country and an inability to put ourselves in the shoes of the people who live in, lived in Vietnam then or the people who lived in Afghanistan now. Right. Um, why, did the, why did the US wars end this way? Does anyone really want to discuss this uh, okay. instead of discussing uh, who's to blame right now? Did Biden do this? Did Biden do that? And everyone has their ax to grind. Uh, people who didn't care a whit about the Afghan people, women, men, or any children or anyone who is Afghan for 40 years, all of a sudden are the posing as the big humanitarians who are just, oh, they're so heartbroken that this terrible thing is happening in Kabul. Yeah. And, uh, you know, obviously uh, there are people who are, who are suffering, who are trying, who want to get out. Uh, 
the same people who are saying the most about how terrible it is and what Biden did wrong, et cetera, et cetera, they're not saying that we should open the United States to all uh -huh. the Jews who want to come. Mm -hmm. They're saying the opposite. So yeah. it's 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 not a happy moment. There's nothing happy about this moment. Uh, yeah. There, you know, uh, I mean, it's a hit to U.S. global power. I mm -hmm. guess that's a good thing. Silver lining. Uh, mm -hmm. But. You know, but uh, not if we don't lear learn the lesson, <laughs> right? Not, not if we continue, yeah. not if we continue down this path. The lack of historical perspective, empathy, uh, the, here we are in, in a country, we're connected all over the world, uh, by the internet and other travel, modern travel, and so on, and it's in some ways, this is the most provincial country on the face of the planet. Mm. But there's nothing more American than blithely refusing to learn from your mistakes. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's like, this is just, this is just classic American behavior yeah. of just knee jerk reaction now and learn nothing and then continue, continue, continue. I want to talk more specifically about what's happening now, just to give some folks an idea. Obviously, the United States has sent back in troops to help with the, you know, um, the the not removal of but help uh, Afghans and those who supported the American occupation to leave that country to seek asylum. Uh, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken. Uh, has been working with 13 different countries that are willing to host Afghan refugees. There's been $500 million pledged to help those Afghan refugees. Um, and so there has, you know, there is that effort that is happening now. Um, there's a lot of pieces to this, Max. And last week I was uh, very, very livid about it. Um, I think the biggest surprise to me is the way, and I shouldn't be surprised, but at the time when we went into Afghanistan, right, there were very few voices against it. And it was a total um, opaque, unified front of the Pentagon, the military, the White House, the of Congress for the most part, except for, you know, folks like Barbara Lee, Representative Barbara, Barbara Lee. Shout out. Um, you know, and every single major media outlet. And remember, we had very few alternative media outlets at that time that sort of had broad reach. Um, saying we must go into Afghanistan, we must occupy this country, we must get them because they harbored terrorists, and we did it. You know, people think the Iraq War was poorly done. Yeah. Look at Afghanistan, like yeah. my God, you know. But but, um, and there's a lot to say on this. So now I am surprised to see the same people, almost the same media figures. Going back into the like, oh my gosh, we what a blunder! Wow, we can't. I can't believe we're doing this. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I believe in getting out, but not like this. But do you believe in getting out? No. <laughs> but were you covering this, you know, a year ago? But have you spoken? I mean, this is the other thing. I'm gonna play a clip, but I do want to say, people keep on talking about how there hasn't been an American casualty since last February, right? But there have been Afghan casualties. There have been civilians that have been hit. Trump ramped up drone strikes, by the way. Civilians have been in the crosshairs of this ever since. And, and this is some good history everyone needs to know. Uh, when the Taliban fled Afghanistan, guess who was left? Civilians. So guess who was turning in so-called terrorists? Civilians on civilians. It was just civilians being like, that's a terrorist, that's a terrorist. And it was just like, and they everyone was, you know, send them to Guantanamo, et cetera. So the difference right now is that we've got a president who seems to be saying different things. He seems to be doubling down on his decision. And I want to play you some clips from Biden this week from a press conference and then the things that he's been saying to, you know, mainstream media. We went and did the mission. You've known my position for a long, long time. It's time to end this war. The estimates of the cost of this war over the last 20 years range from a minimum of $1 trillion to a think tank at one of the universities saying $2 trillion. That's somewhere between $150 million a day and $300 million a day. If I had said on May the 2nd or 3rd, we are not leaving, we are staying, does anybody truly believe 
that I would not have had to put in significantly more American forces, send your sons, your daughters, like my son was sent to Iraq, to maybe die? And for what? Max, your response to how Biden is playing it, and specifically those those bits. The, uh, Biden is telling half-truths, and that's better than no truths. Uh, so uh, the fact that this war is unwinnable by the United States, the United States lost uh, and is not doing any good in Afghanistan, uh, acknowledging that is a good thing. And uh, I will give him the credit for being willing to take the flack for being the one to pull the plug. Because whoever pulls the plug on a U.S. war that isn't a total victory is going to catch political flack. Yeah. Yeah. But what is unsaid and what he said in other clips, essentially blaming the Afghans for what's happening is dead wrong. Yeah. Uh, this war was unwinnable from day one. Mm -hmm. And the ignorance about Afghanistan, Afghan society, and the Afghan people, we've just had an example of it. Here, the, the, the government didn't know two weeks ago yeah. that this is the kind of thing that was going to happen, shows that we, the, we, it's, you know, we in the sense that I'm part of the United States, whether I like it or not, <laughs> but the government, the national security establishment, the generals, I mean, the level of ignorance uh, and the level of deception and self-deception is, is just off the hook. And that's not different from Vietnam either, the level mm. of deception and self-deception. Uh, the we have to face the fact, and I have, uh, you know, the Taliban's politics and my politics are quite different. Uh, <laughs> but we Aww. have to face the fact that more people in Afghanistan at this stage preferred Taliban rule to the continued rule of the government, uh, if you want to call it a government, that was mm -hmm. a cobbled together corrupt pyramid scheme yes. by the United States and a bunch of opportunists. There were also sincere people who felt that was a better way in the mm -hmm. cities, who, who either because of their critique of the Taliban or what they thought was possible uh, in the government. So the, it's very painful. Those people are going to suffer. Uh, and are suffering, and those are the people who are trying to get out right now. And we have an, we, the United States and the rest of the world has an obligation to them in a civil war. It's never simple. And it's not all good guys on one side and all bad guys on the other side. There are reasons why people take the stances they do. And, uh, you know, the point about putting yourself in other people's shoes. It's really easy from a distance to say, oh, this or oh, that or the other thing. It's not so simple. Uh, when you're in the middle of a country that's being wrecked, there's a bunch of people with guns floating around. There's all kinds of different ideological currents, different political forces, governments intervening, mercenaries. It, it, you know, it, it's, it, it's not, a, a, not a good time for all the holier than thou uh, purism coming from the United States. So there's people yeah. suffering who oppose the Taliban, and there's plenty of people who supported the Taliban because we bombed their weddings, we bombed their villages, uh, and the government was stealing from them. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you have to have some sympathy for them too, even if you don't like the politics uh, yeah. of the Taliban and so on. I mean, I mean, they're a creation of the modern world. All this nonsense about them being, you know, primitive or from the past. Of course, they're certain looking to the past. Everybody looks to the past. Look at the United States. We've huh. got a whole movement that's talking about make America great again. And, a, you know, third of the country that thinks we should go back not just to the 1950s, but maybe to the 1850s. Yeah. Uh, or, or at least the rollback of Reconstruction and the new yep. change. So, you know, and the Taliban, you know, they look to certain things in Afghan history, but they're a product of the modern world. 
yeah. uh, the kind of nationalism, the kind of different uh, colonialism and dealing with colonialism and all of that. So, yeah. you know, Biden is, it, it's the right decision to get out of Afghanistan. His explanations don't, uh, you know, are unwilling to confront the real truth of what happened. Just yeah. like the United States was unwilling after Vietnam to confront the real truth of what happened in Vietnam. And, I mean, and, sorry. You know, we need a Truth and Reconciliation Commission for the globe, and the United States should be part of that. But it, it's just, uh, you know, uh, every country that's been at the center of a global empire for a long time it builds in an imperial mentality. You still see the remnants of it in Britain today, for heaven's sake. And oh, they, yeah. you know, Britannia hasn't ruled the waves for a hundred years. And there's all this nonsense. They're still worried about We're the addicted. skin color of their grandchild. <laughs> they still have a queen. They still have a queen. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, look, I do think that in you're right that Biden is never going to admit that the United States just lost the war. And there is some good analysis around um, the fact that this was, even though it is chaotic, it was the best way because essentially they knew that the Taliban had been taking control over territory as Trump had been winding down, um, pulling troops out, had made a deal with the Taliban, even though, of course, they don't own up to that. Um, and that this was going to come sooner or later, it was going to come. Um, and that what would have looked worse two scenarios. One, we handed control over the Talib to the Taliban. That would have looked terrible. Uh, or two, we left a hundred troops. Suddenly they're surrounded in Kandahar by a bunch of Taliban with Afghan forces and there's casualties. Right. That would have been very, very bad. So there's, it's hard to imagine somehow the media is not imagining there are worse scenarios. Ooh, there's been a worse scenario in the last 20 years, i.e. the status quo that was the occupation of Afghanistan. Not only that, but also uh, it, you kind of look at the way that kind of the mainstream media uh, is bringing on people who are just talking about, um, you know, this horrible situation this terrible pullout that has happened and how the uh, the afghan people just uh, they didn't fight back we trained them we gave them all the weapons and they just did not fight sure, back we embezzled a lot of it you know yeah. there's billions that we kept for ourselves but, but we can't believe they didn't fight back which says to me uh number one a lot of them are just uh mad about their job security ending because a lot of these people made their names off of uh covering wars like afghanistan but number two uh, it says to me that these people would prefer a civil war to what's happening right now. They would sure. prefer to make themselves feel better about what is happening, uh, about America leaving. They would prefer that there were a prolonged civil war. And the fact that they didn't get that, they didn't get that happening, that's just, uh, you know, that for them, that's the, that's the true tragedy of the situation is the fact that they didn't get their, their precious civil war. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just want to play one of the people that has been on mainstream television lately. You've got John Bolton uh, on NPR. You've got Bush and Blair, Tony Blair. Oh, my talking God, Blair. About how they would have done things differently. If it were me, I think I would have stayed in another 20 years. I can't do a posh British accent. No, you really can't. Uh, so I, it's not. You're so just going to do the chimney do, sweep. Oh, 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 I'm a chimney sweep. But that's what Tony um, Blair sounds like. But here you have Nikki Haley, uh, who is using this. And I believe the media is allowing the right to use this moment to score lots of points against Biden. Someone you know well, the former Secretary of State in the Trump administration, Mike Pompeo, stood alongside one of the Taliban founders and helped negotiate this deal in which President Trump signed an agreement to have United States forces out earlier this year. Did that set in motion what we're seeing now? You know, I think everybody's wanting to go back and talk about Trump. The truth is, under four years of Trump, Afghanistan was safe. We made sure that we kept terrorism at bay and that we came from a strength of position. What's happened in seven months of Biden is we've completely surrendered and we've humiliated ourselves in the eyes of the world. So it's interesting, right? Because you have ostensibly 
the MAGA crowd, which is anti-interventionist, which is America first in the most xenophobic and nationalist way, mm -hmm. um, dropping that line when it comes to supporting, you know, these hits against Biden, when in fact, Biden and Trump are actually allied on this topic, you know, in terms of pulling out of Afghanistan. Um, now we're seeing the rise of suddenly everyone's a neocon. Yeah, again. the neocons are back. Yeah. Max, what are your what are your thoughts on whether this politically is going to hurt Biden in the long run? Or do you think that everyone's going to move on that realignment? Uh, sure, it's going to hurt Biden uh, because the right wing, it, 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 the intersection of this in U.S. politics uh, it, you start to get into the framing in U.S. politics, which has little to do with the reality of what's happened in Afghanistan. Yeah, mm -hmm. the framing in U.S. politics. There's a there's a a, a great quote from Lyndon Johnson in 1965, before he escalated the war, where he's talking to Richard Russell, the senator from Georgia, where he says, um, "We're not going to win this war, but I I'll be roasted." if I don't uh, keep the communists at bay. They knew they were going to lose in 1965. Jeez. This, is, this is Vietnam. Two million Vietnamese were killed, 50,000 Americans, a country wrecked, and they knew in 1965 they were going to lose. Mm -hmm. So the intersection with U.S. politics in MAGA land and in most of the rest of the country is we're still the greatest country in the world. Mm -hmm. And if something goes wrong, it's not our fault. At, or it went wrong, but we were well-intentioned. Mm -hmm. And the other people are to blame. Mm -hmm. So the right wing's going to tap into that no matter what happened in Afghanistan. Sure. And that section of people is going to be against the Democrats because they regard the Democrats. This has, it, it, it gets into another uh, it gets into a related topic, but it's not strictly only about Afghanistan. It's mm -hmm. about the other. The mm -hmm. Democrats are in, in the MAGA land. The Democrats are fronting for the other, the dark-skinned people who are becoming too many and taking over the country. Uh, that's what's going on on that side of the fence. Yeah. And then on the side of the fence of people who are against the Trumpists, there's a wide diversity of views. The, the, the progressives, the left, the people who watch this uh, and listen to this podcast are part of the progressive left, the social justice movements. But there's plenty of other people who are against Trump, too, for various reasons. Uh, some of them are morally outraged by the racism. Some of them see believe in U.S. democracy of the way, you know, the, the way it's been practiced and thinks Trump is a threat to that, all kinds of different diverse reasons. Mm -hmm. But that section of the population is vulnerable to this, is, is, has not given up the idea of Ameri we're number one. Yes. They just, they just don't, a large sections of that don't see it in the same crude and racist way that the Trump people see it. And they're vulnerable to this because the people, I mean, the education system in the end, how many people know anything about Afghanistan? I mean, here we fought, the, the, you know, the, the people who know the most are some of the people who served over there. And there's yeah. some interesting stories about the conflicted feelings of the veterans who were over there and the small number of other Americans who've ever been to Afghanistan and a handful, you know, experts and people who uh, have thought about it for one reason or another. So yeah. sure, I mean, and you know, but, the right is going to take an effort, um, is going to take anything that occurs because at, at this point, the the MAGA faction, the Jim Crow faction, I don't even think it's fair to call them the Republican Party. It, it, the media no. is still looking at things that U.S. politics is Republicans and Democrats. But U.S. politics, that's only one dimension of it. U.S. politics right now is really the Jim Crow faction versus the majority that believes in some kind of equality or multiracial society on some kind of close to a democratic basis. 
That's mm -hmm. the actual divide in U.S. politics. It overlaps with partisan politics, but it's not essentially Democratic versus Republican. We have the heirs to the Confederacy in a new guise, wanting to take the country back to Jim Crow. They're anti-immigrant, they're anti-people of color, anti-black, it, it goes a whole bunch of anti-LGBTQ and sexist stuff goes with that. Anti-Semitism is prominent in some parts of that movement. That's the essential divide in US politics. And then on the side that's against that, there's all kinds of different forces. And you see it in the media. The information systems, and you, you, you've you talked about this on your show many times, you, you have a whole media uh, coverage, you know, on this show. The right-wing media is talking points. You said this somewhere earlier in this show. There are just talking points. And it's a, you, within hours, Fox News, OAN, Newsmax, they're all talking the same talking point, whatever it is. And they right. just take one thing in the next. On the anti-Trump side, it's not parallel. There's differences of opinion. So CNN, yeah. MSNBC, the New York Times, they'll run op-eds that go in both. They'll run John Bolton, but they'll also run one uh, from uh, someone from uh, About Face, Vets Against the War. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you know, on this side, it gets very, very complicated uh, in terms of keeping that front together against the Trumpists and still fighting within that front over what the hell is really going on here and what the hell just happened in Afghanistan and what happened in Afghanistan for the last 40 years. Yeah, I, I think um, on that point, um, what has been hard to see is that there hasn't been a strong anti-war progressive anti-war stance, you know, Biden is showing the most leadership on a national level. And again, you're right that he is not, he's telling half truths, but it makes me feel like Democrats, it, when we are playing partisan politics, never know and can never see their openings. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. it's like having, I don't, I don't play football. I don't know anything about football, but I'm like, I see the openings. And it's like, if you're a running back and you're not going for the opening, you're going for the fucking clusterfuck you know you're going for like where the dudes are yeah you know, you go for your openings there's an opening here to say yes we are you know proudly pulling the united states out of the middle east because the majority of americans believe the war in afghanistan was fought for nothing the majority of americans want to get out of it and then you've got you see op-eds where they called biden's policy america first light which is so sad to me. It's not um, a new dawn for you know foreign policy in the United States, which it might not be a new dawn yet. But calling it America First Light is basically, to, in my mind, I hear like, oh, isolationism, Nazi light. Like it just right. feels like it, it's very sad. So I guess may, maybe more broadly, do you think this could be the beginning of turning a page a, away from the war on terror playbook? Because remember, one thing I feel like we need to remember, when Obama wound down the war in Iraq, he ramped up the war in Afghanistan. You can bet your ass if he had wound both of them down, he would have been like us, like annihilated over that decision. But what do you feel like this means more broadly for U.S. military power in the world and our foreign policy? Or what could it mean? Well, I'm not as optimistic as that. Uh, yes. I think that uh, the shift in American politics uh, is the, sh the positive things about the Biden administration have to do with a realization in the Democratic Party leadership that the levels of inequality, economic and racial inequality, the neglect of the infrastructure, all of this kind of thing, and a certain amount of worry about the kind of ethno-nationalism uh, and racism of the Trump administration, that all of the, uh, all those kinds of things make for an unstable society that is not going to occupy uh, the leading role in the world. Mm -hmm. So it's a complicated situation where, on the one hand, there are trying to move some domestic policies and trying to be have somewhat of a level of responsibility around the pandemic and around climate change 
to, to create something that's a little more sustainable and that's a little better uh, for ordinary people, workers and middle classes. Mm -hmm. And to that extent, we're gonna be traveling a little bit of the way, pushing constantly with the Democratic Party establishment on domestic issues. But on the foreign policy issues, I think they remain as committed to glo U.S. global hegemony as the Trump administration did. Mm -hmm. mm. uh, I do think that they uh, they uh, are they have some different tactics from Trump. The rhetoric is different. Uh, I think in some places there's more openings. Uh, I think the fact that they take, take climate change more seriously and the climate change denialists who are running the Republican Party means that there is some leverage because we can't fight climate change if we're fighting wars and we're not dealing with international cooperation. Uh, right. It's a new level of urgency. I mean, for people, who, even people who haven't been paying attention with the extreme weather situations that we're seeing now are starting to pay attention, uh, even in Republican uh, areas. Mm -hmm. So there's some leverage there. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, on foreign policy issues, we're in a lot of trouble because the Democratic Party establishment is not, uh, they, they realized that they had to get out of Afghanistan, but uh, the, look, their policies around Palestine, they didn't reverse a lot of the Trump things, and especially the new Cold War against China or, yep. you know, all of that. So I think... Yeah, that, they're pulling the resources out to go right to China. And so I think we're in a very tricky situation. And again, speaking as an old man who lived through the 60s, you know, if you look at the Lyndon Johnson administration... The 64, 65, and the passing of the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, the end of racist immigration quotas, the beginning of the war on poverty, these things were incredibly progressive. Uh, mm -hmm. Linda, you know, everyone talks about Roosevelt. Johnson was more progressive than Roosevelt on race and races. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, uh, Roosevelt cut the deal with the Dixiecrats, and Lyndon Johnson didn't. Uh, so on on domestic issues, there was the beginning of a of a new progressive moment uh, in the mid '60s. Now, of course, that wasn't because Lyndon Johnson woke up one morning and said, "I'm going to make things progressive." It was all yeah. the civil rights movement. It was the yeah. civil rights movement moving forward uh, and pushing things. And it also had to do with the Cold War and the fact that the United States was competing for hearts and minds around the world. Mm. Everybody, every, it's now taken as a given that the reason Brown versus Board of Education was nine to nothing in 1954 was because it was too embarrassing for the United States to have segregation when they were trying to win hearts and minds in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. So they yeah. made sure that they got a unanimous decision against segregation. So there were all kinds of pressures, but Johnson did move with those pressures. And then mm -hmm. the war in Vietnam, which completely sabotaged that progressive moment, totally split uh, you know, the coalition that had been behind Johnson, because of course we weren't gonna support that imperialist war. Uh, it was a racist war, it was an imperialist war, and my generation of radicals went in there and we fought against Lyndon Johnson. That didn't mean we didn't recognize that the, what had happened in 64, 65 wasn't a positive thing. Right. But but we had we had to fight. And then the same kind of tricky thing is gonna happen now, which is we're gonna be fighting the Biden administration on global politics. We're gonna be fighting them on chi on the policy toward China. We're going to be fighting them on their policy toward Palestine and the Middle East. I mean, all this stuff about Afghan women, and we're still giving all this aid to Saudi Arabia. I mean, does anyone yeah. really believe that anyone in the U.S. ruling class is thinking about Afghan women? I mean, there may be some individuals who genuinely feel that way, but that's not what's driving American policy. Mm -hmm. but we're going to be in a very complicated situation where we have to fight around the international issues with the administration and with the Democratic Party establishment. And at the same time, we have to 
keep the Trumpists out of power because yeah. Trumpists getting back into power not only means destruction for the world, but it, the, the, the uh, people are in denial about what level of repression, especially against African-Americans and people of color, will come down. Uh, yes. We're back in Jim Crow 2.0. So this is a mm -hmm. complicated, we're going to face a lot of really complicated politics. And, um, you know, uh, it, it's, it, you know, what you said about the MAGA people, they're isolationists, but isolationism did, never meant, uh, and certainly since the atomic bomb exploded, isolationism did not mean anti-interventionism. It just meant when you intervene, you bomb the crap out of them. You know, this is, you know, uh, what's his name? Curtis LeMay. We're going to bomb Vietnam back to the Stone Age. Right. right. Politics were America first isolationism. At the end of the Vietnam which, which War. Which are Trump's, I mean, that Trump has exactly. said that. We should have taken all the oil in Iraq. Right. So he always it, gets assigned. He's, I just, yeah, you're right. It's like, yeah, the next. To do, nothing to do with concern about the people no. in those countries. No. It's simply that. If you intervene, kill them all right. and just take what you want to take. Right. Nation so, building, women, schools, who cares, right? Who cares about any of that? Yeah. So, uh, you know, we're going to face a very complicated political landscape over the next few years. And uh, the left is going to have to learn a level of sophistication that, you know, my generation did not have when we were young. We made all kinds of mistakes. I mean, you mentioned my book. It's a book about a lot of mistakes. I mean, yeah. I, it, we did a lot of things that, uh, you know, we contributed to many progressive struggles, but you could make a list of, you could do a whole, many shows. About you could write a book. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we will make mistakes again. You can't do politics without making mistakes. Yeah. But we, the mistakes, we have to try to minimize the mistakes because the stakes are high now. The stakes yeah. are even higher than they were at our generation because of the level of destructiveness of violence, the, 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 the fact that we're facing a set of people who really believe that their whole civilization is at stake, that white Christian America is going to go down the tubes if the Democrats take power, you know, we're and climate change. So we're facing a really difficult situation and there's going to be differences of opinion on the left. We're going to have fights with each other and we're going to have to learn how to keep those in bounds and not burn bridges with one another the way many people, many of us did back then. Yeah. Uh, so we, you know, we got a tough road and a I, little I, empathy for people who are traveling this road and who are in other places in the world uh, certainly would help. Yeah. And I mean, one thing, and we have to move on, but one thing I just wanted to name is that we've always talked about, you know, whether it's Iraq or Afghanistan, that, um, you know, internationalism, which the movements of the sixties and seventies had a much stronger, um, you know, uh, foundation in a certain international solidarity that it has been harder because of like, no one's going to ally themselves with the Taliban. You know, you're not, it's the enemy of your enemy is not your friend, but that there are grassroots organizations, whether in Iraq or in Afghanistan, they're not always easy to find. They're not always the ones trotted out safely in front of, you know, on CNN and whatnot, but that there, there are organizations. And I, you know, I look to you if you know of any, but I, I found, you know, Afghans for a better tomorrow that are uh, advocating for an evacuation of Afghans from the, from that country, opening the doors of other countries, removing red tape and then humanitarian aid to the country. Um, I remember, you know, it, back in the day, the Iraqi union of Iraqi oil workers was a group that folks were bringing over. And there was a lot of um, you know, in a small corner of the anti-war movement, which the anti-war movement effectively doesn't exist. But any other thoughts on that sort of moving forward solidarity before we just wrap this up? Yeah, we need that kind of people to people uh, solidarity. And uh, wherever there are people struggling for a more democratic and more progressive uh, society where they live, uh, we need to uh, try to understand what their thinking is and see what we can do to help them. 
Uh, it's in our own interest. It's solidarity. It's not charity. And mm -hmm. we need to be a little less uh, ideologically rigid uh, mm -hmm. about, uh, you know, they have to believe X, Y, and Z of our program for socialist revolution before we can support them. I right. think that kind of thinking uh, has to be dispensed with. 100%. Um, mm -hmm. Take it from Max Album. He's wonderful. Everybody read Revolution in the Air. It is, uh, it's wonderful. It's a great anthology. And, and Max has a million talks online that you can find. And Organizing Upgrade uh, is a place to see a lot of his analysis and others. Um, they write great stuff. But Max, will you stay with us for our final segment? Sure. In for a dime, in for a dollar. Yeah. <laughs> Clearly. Um, all right. We got one more segment, you guys. I want you to remember after this, after just hearing that, that no, this doesn't mean U.S. empire is over. I got ahead of myself. Um, <laughs> and that the media still doesn't get it and everything's sad and uh, people are still suffering. Um, and we've got a lot of work ahead of us. There are still good things in the world. So this is our final segment. And I want you all to think, what is good? Good. I forgot that Cardi B was at the end of that interstitial, and I love Becca for that, <laughs> as well as many other things. Um, Matt Lieb, what's good? Softball with your friends. Aww. Today I uh, I did my my weekly. Um, you got friends? Sort of. I mean, it's the people I play softball with that oh, were right. softball friends. Were friendly. Will they help you move? No, I mean they'll help me move like my baseball glove <laughs> to the car sorry keep the... talking the point is is uh yeah no uh, playing softball with friends that's that's what's good i played a little softball today uh did you hit a home run i didn't i hit a lot of uh pop flies grounders to first uh no grounders to first um <laughs> but i did pop flies Pop fly, well, they caught them. They caught them, yeah, yeah. Um, Could you run though to first in the pop fly? You know, you can do that. No, as I, I would, I, I was gonna run, but <laughs> then I was like, they're gonna catch it, so why exert myself? Um, and, Baseball, why exert? <laughs> exactly, come on. <laughs> um, but I did hit uh, the game winner. The oh. ga yeah, the game winning run was was me. Oh, I did baby. it. Hercules. I'm strong. <laughs> so uh, that's what's good, you know? Uh, yeah, you know, hell yeah. In this time of the Delta variant, um, you can still get together with your friends, rent a softball field from, you know, your local municipal park, and, uh, you know, play a little bit of softball. Great. That's a good one. Uh, Max Elbaum, what's, what's good? Well, I was trying to think of a counterpoint to all of the terrible lack of historical memory around Afghanistan. <laughs> so um, I saw Summer of Soul, the movie. Uh, oh, yeah. About the Harlem Cu Cultural Festival. And yes. Time is Woodstock. And then was hidden for 50 years, the film. And they only got it financed uh, in the last few years. Uh, yeah. And it's a fantastic film. Uh it's fantastic. It's a documentary, and it's fantastic not just because of the music, but you really get a sense of what people were thinking. There's lots of interviews with people in the audience, and you get a sense of what the thinking was uh, in Harlem, in the Black community especially, at that time. And uh, the good thing about that is it's not an isolated thing. It's part of a whole, uh, even if it's not dominant in the country, the level of discussion of the history of the United States, particularly around anti-Blackness and around uh, what the legacy of slavery is and uh, the history of uh, different chapters that have not been written about, whether it was the New York Times in the 1619 Project and uh, all the discussion about the Tulsa massacre, uh, yes. you know, and in, in things that even in the 60s, uh, when the Black Freedom Movement was at its height, the level of historical reexamination was not didn't penetrate as deeply as it has in the last few years, especially since the uprising. And it's a counter trend to this trend of 
uh, myopia and ahistoricism in the country. Yes. Uh, and it wouldn't be the last time, it wouldn't be the first time that it comes out of the Black Freedom Movement, that that's a driving force of taking a look at the real history of this country. Uh, and uh, so I think uh, it's a great movie. Uh, it It's amazing that so many of us who were political activists at that time, if we didn't live in New York and I didn't, didn't even know about this was happening when Woodstock yeah. was on the front page everywhere. Uh, right. and part of a much broader trend. So I think that's something good and it's something that we can all access. And it, it's the kind of thing that, um, you know, I, I can even after, you know, feeling all this pain about what's going on in Afghanistan and Vietnam and other places, I can look at something like this and talk about some of the shoots of positive things and the number of young people who are learning at a much earlier age to grapple with these issues and with a sophistication that I never had at that yeah. time in life. Well, it's thanks to you also that, you know, thanks for uh, blazing the trail, as they say, uh, going first. And um, that's a really good thing to think is good. I was trying to think and I, I'm struggling to think of what is good. And I always just come back to my cat. Oh, uh, Ramona Chitty is good. She's the, fat. The best cat. She's happy. She's sweet. You know, I try to put a face filter on her face, but she's too cute. So she just looks exactly as the same as the cartoon face filter and she's always loving and she sits on my lap and I pet her and I kiss her and then she kisses me mm -hmm. and, uh, and then she escapes into the neighbor's yard and I have to go get her and I'm like, Ramona, I'm gonna break my foot off in your ass and then she yeah. runs back. I do yell at her like that. That'd you be do. really funny if I did. Yeah. Um, anyway, she's she's adorable. There's that and I that's guess- something that's good. I think that's good. I like stand-up. That's been really good when, good whenever I do shows, but it's few and far between. Um, Max Elbaum, thank you so much for being here. Everybody, uh, f w follow Max on Organizing Upgrade. Is that correct, Max? Yeah, that's fine. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, do that. Thanks. Thanks. It's fun to see you guys again. It's it's been a little bit, and uh, yeah. it's been too long. Um, that's. I'll be I'll be in the bay, so I will I will hit you up. Yes, let's uh, have a socially distanced. Uh, there's a nice park not far from here. Yeah. Okay, good. That's right. You are an elder. Must be beware. And softball. Let's play softball. Yeah. Softball. And, and Max. <laughs> um, Max is also a marathon runner, so uh, oh, wow. he, he gets out a lot. Um, and good luck with that run. Take very good care. See you next time. Later. And thank you, Matt Lieb, for joining me. Hey, happy to be here. You know, just uh, just enjoy it. Just enjoy being here. Is it enjoy just having to you? Be here. Before we go, I'm going to read a few more comments. Uh, not leave everybody hanging I'll stick on around. Afghanistan. Meditating over dragon on Twitch, avoidable by not going in the first place. That's exactly what we're trying to say. Yeah, and yeah. It's hard to make that case, but you're like, I, you see. I had the exact same comment when when it happened. It was like this was completely unavoidable. I was like, no, it's avoidable in one way. Very avoidable. We could have just not done it uh andrew martin on youtube as always afghanistan was a scam to enrich the military industrial complex schultzy 100 hi uh on youtube no one ever mentions the afghan death toll now nor any time during the war who even knows yeah i've seen various numbers you know because it is if it's an afghan soldier that is sort of not counted as a civilian so they fluctuate wildly um but you know but it's in the tens of thousands for sure and displacement that's in you know hundreds of thousands uh, upwards um new world dragon on youtube what war it was an invasion that's very true uh, many people call it a one-sided war uh in a lot of ways in those early days no one was actually fighting back mm. um kedge dragon on youtube people running around with guns wildly different politics and religious views police mer military mercenaries i thought max was talking about the united states exactly nice. and there's a lot of parallels, as we're now realizing. We have our own Taliban over here, our uh, religious fundamentalists trying to run yeah, things. Yeah, vanilla ISIS. Um, and thank you for the Super Chats, Oregon Dragon, Daniel C.O. Parker, uh, Dave K.O., Undecided, and Nathan G. And to the new Twitch subs, fat guy named Tiny, Dino Boyer, uh, Kin of Wolf, and What Mutt. Thank you all so much. Thank you to Becca Rufer, to Max Inhoff, to Ellie Hoffman, to Alexandra Orness. Um, remember, we stream every Sunday, 5, 8 Eastern on YouTube and Twitch. That's going to change. We are picking a new day, most likely. 
Tuesdays, y'all. Oh, for real? So, yeah, for real. I didn't even know that. So everyone gets their weekends back. Hell yeah. But hey, to support any bonus content that we have, which we'll, we will be doing bonus shows, you get early access to that. You get access to the Ask Me Anythings. Become a patron. Patreon.com slash Bituation Room. This show is not sponsored by anybody except for you. That's right. Um, And, oh, wait a minute. I forgot to read everyone's what we were happy about. This will be a good outro. I'm doing this all backwards. But everyone's uh, thinks uh, Ratatouille Chinese food, wine and beer, this show, having Aww. a support group, the Fortnite Ariana Grande concert. Cool. Club, Hell yeah. Random kindness, music, the beach, 69. Cool. Summer of Soul, the show, and it's the truth are all things that are good 69 um, hell yeah and with that remember guys fight the power fuck the patriarchy and don't just bitch about it be about it see you next time